Good morning, it's Friday morning and you're very welcome to our thought for today. Hopefully, uh, if you've been working, you've got that Friday feeling, that opportunity of unwinding over the weekend and uh, the opportunity of maybe spending time with family. And I, I hope and pray everyone who watches this will have a great weekend. Uh, this Sunday morning in, in Kalinchi Presbyterian, we've got, well, obviously not in the church, but online will be the Reverend Derek McKelvey. I'll be speaking to the folk in Second Cumber on Sunday morning. So we look forward to Derek's message on Sunday morning and encourage you to uh, plan to be there for the, the premiere. It's always good if you can get to watch the premiere at 11 o'clock when it goes live because that means there's a sense of us all being together and watching the service at the same time. But anyway, this morning we're going to try and tie up uh, another thought from the, the passage on the woman who had the 12-year bleed, uh, reaching out, touching Jesus and getting that healing. And we're not really thinking about her this morning and we're, we're not really thinking necessarily about Jesus' response, nor are we speaking really about Jairus or even his daughter. So who does that leave in this passage? Well, if you were watching yesterday, I, I gave you a little bit of a, a heads up that this morning we're going to be thinking about the disciples because something happens with them in this passage, which uh, I think, you know, it, it was something that maybe in the future they look back on and regretted. And we're thinking about trying to live with, without regrets today. The passage, uh, the verse I'm thinking about really comes where in verse 30, and we read this yesterday, and Jesus perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? Now, as you read this, you almost sort of read this sort of jokingness into the disciples. Jesus, are you serious? Look, we're told here that the people were pressing in against him, that they were all around him. A great crowd followed him in, in verse, uh, verse 24. A great crowd followed him and thronged about him or pressed in about him. So if you've ever been in a crowd of people, and I can remember being at a, an Irish rugby match down in Lansdowne Road, as it used to be called, uh, and leaving the ground and the, the crowd was so thick and heavy I, I lost where my dad was and at, at one point I was actually lifted off the ground by the, the, the crowd of people around me and I was actually carried for a few meters down the street without actually touching the ground. The crowd was that tight and, and that compressed that I was actually lifted off the ground and I, I, I was moving with the crowd and this idea of this throng of people all around Jesus is almost like they've heard where he's going. He's going to go to Jairus' house. We all know where that, that house is. Let's all go. And so this huge crowd was going with Jesus and Jesus was in the middle of it. And obviously he was attracting people to him. And in the middle of it all, this woman somehow reaches out and touches him as, as he was going ahead of her. And Jesus senses that and we know from yesterday what, what, what went on there. But he makes a statement, you know, who touched me? And the disciples jokingly sort of say, hang on, Lord, you know, there everyone's touching you. There are people pressing against all of us. We're, we're actually under a lot of pressure here. This is, this is a little bit crazy. And for you to suddenly ask who's touching you, what are we supposed to do? Because everyone's touching you. It's a crazy thing to say. Now, of course, it's a crazy thing to say because the answer is everyone is touching you, Lord. But yet Jesus knew that someone in need had touched him. And we thought about this connection, this miracle connection through faith. But for the disciples, they, they still hadn't properly worked out who Jesus was. We got a sight of it again. Do you remember on the, the crossing over, first of all, to the eastern side of the lake when the storm blew up? And they went to Jesus and they were amazed at his power over the wind and the waves. And that that's really surprised them because they hadn't quite worked out yet who Jesus was. They were still trying to process it all. They knew he was doing incredible things and he was someone special, but they hadn't still yet put one on one together and got two. They were still trying to work it out. In fact, that went on throughout the rest of Jesus' ministry. Even at the garden when they scattered, when Jesus was arrested in the garden of Gethsemane, they still didn't realize who he was and so they, they ran. Even if you think back to to the, the time when Peter denied Jesus three times. Even when, if you remember that, that there was that sense of afterwards when Thomas said, you know, unless I can put my finger in the hole where the nails were, I'm not going to believe. The, the 
incredulity continued right until Jesus ascended, actually really until the Holy Spirit came upon them. And we know that on Pentecost, all of a sudden, they were changed. The Holy Spirit came upon them, gave them that power, not only to do the things that they did, but also to understand fully who Jesus was. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly don't want to be the sort of person who who lives with the regrets of, of not believing who Jesus was. I remember growing up as a teenager, in between listening to all the music of the day, I, as a Christian, I was trying to intersperse some of the things that I was listening uh, to with, with Christian music. And I remember listening to a group called Petra, obviously named after the, the rock and the, the idea of uh, the, the Greek word for rock, etc. But then one of their songs had a line that said, I'd rather be a fool in the eyes of men than a fool in the eyes of God. And as a teenager, that, that one line made such a difference to my life. Because it meant that I, I didn't want to be, uh, people could laugh at me as much as they wanted for being a Christian. And, and they did. But yet I didn't, I didn't uh, want to, to meet Jesus face to face as we thought about back at the start of the week. And for, for him to look at me and say, you fool, you had it all. You had the opportunity of following me and making a difference for me. But you decided not to do it. You fool. You allowed yourself to be aligned with the world and to laugh at me instead of coming on my side and trusting me. And that always struck me as a, such an important thought. I'd rather be a fool in the eyes of, of men than a fool in the eyes of God. The disciples, they, they, they couldn't understand. The Holy Spirit allowed them to understand. And I wonder at that point, did they have regrets? Thinking back, saying, oh, if only I'd realised who Jesus was. I wouldn't have laughed at him. I wouldn't have thought that that was a crazy thing to do. I wouldn't have denied him, but rather I would have done so many things differently. And I don't want any one of you to, to live with those regrets. Accept Jesus Christ for who he is, for what he says he is. Don't allow yourself to fall in line with the world when they're all laughing and joking about Jesus or about Christians or things like that. Don't be a fool in the eyes of God because you didn't want to be a fool in the eyes of men. Hopefully you'll understand what I'm trying to say this morning. Hopefully you have a good weekend and uh, hopefully you'll tune in at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning for our morning service. See you soon. God bless.